Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. My name is Martin Ludden. I'm the executive director, and we're really happy to have you. Um, we are a nonprofit community media center here in St. Paul. We've been doing this since 1984, uh, and part of our stated mission is to build common understanding, which is which what we're up to tonight. We have partnered with the League of Women Voters of St. Paul uh, throughout this election uh, season. We've done a number of forums with them. We are so happy to partner with them again tonight. We are happy to have you all here. We are happy to have you all here. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Amy Perna to go from here. Thank you, Amy. Hello, everybody, um, and welcome again to our debate on the trash referendum tonight. Um, my name is Amy Perna. I am the co-president of the League of Women Voters St. Paul. And we are a 100-year-old nonpartisan organization that is devoted to civic education and participation. So events like this are our bread and butter, and we're so happy that we have so many people here tonight. So thank you again for coming out and spending the night with us. Um, our moderator this evening is Tim Post. Uh, Mr. Post is a communications and public relations professional who lives in St. Paul. He has a background in journalism and has served um, his community as the secretary for the District 10 Como Community Council. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Tim Post. Thanks, everybody. Uh, as you know, the transition to organized collection in St. Paul's trash system has generated a lot of discussion on both sides of the issue. On November 5th, citizens will have the chance to vote either yes or no on a referendum on whether Ordinance 18-39 should remain in effect. Even though the vote is coming up in only one week, many questions still remain. We're here tonight to hear from both sides of the issue in an effort to better equip voters to make an informed decision when they go to the polls. Tonight, we have representatives from two political action committees, St. Paul Trash Lawsuit, whose members are working to convince voters to vote no and repeal the ordinance that created rules and regulations around the central system. And yes for St. Paul, whose members are working to encourage voters to support the ordinance and vote yes. Representing the vote yes side is Javier Murillo and Minister Janae Bates. Javier is an organizer, writer, podcaster, and social justice advocate in St. Paul. He won national attention for the organizing he led for 14 years at the helm of Service Employees International Union Local 26. That's a union of janitors and other service workers. He's an 18-year resident of the west side of St. Paul, where he and his husband, John Stiles, have both served on the board of the West Side Citizens Organization. Janae Bates lives, works, and worships in St. Paul. She's the communications director for Isaiah. Janae specializes in integrating grassroots community organizing and narrative strategy so that all people, regardless of what they look like or where they come from, can thrive. She has over a decade of academic and professional experience in ministry, social justice, and communications. Janae is also an associate minister at Camphor Memorial United Methodist Church in the Rondo area. Representing the vote no side tonight will be Tom Goldstein, uh, Tom Goldstein and Elizabeth Dickinson. Tom Goldstein is a lawyer, a former St. Paul School Board member, and a union organizer. In 2017, he was a candidate for St. Paul mayor. He lives in the Midway neighborhood. Elizabeth Dickinson has lived on the west side for over 20 years, has served as a community activist and board member for multiple environmental nonprofits, and works as an organizer, writer, life coach, and landlord. She was the Green Party candidate for St. Paul mayor in 2017 and holds degrees in education and psychology. Everyone participating in tonight's debate has agreed to the following rules ahead of time. Each side will give a five-minute introductory statement. During the debate, each side will then have three minutes to answer a question with a one-minute rebuttal from the opposing side. A timer, our timers are sitting up here in the front, will signal when there is 30 seconds remaining and when their time is up. Questions have been selected in advance from the public, will not take questions from the audience tonight. Literature for or against this topic or anything else like a t-shirt, uh, other clothing, buttons, or signage is not allowed in this room. 
and you can find more information about the topic at the tables outside of the studio. Please remain quiet so that everyone can hear the conversation tonight and uh, hold your applause until the end of the forum has, uh, until we've come to the end of the forum so that our panel has as much time as possible to answer their questions. And if you're being disruptive, we'll have to ask you to leave. And also, please put your cell phones on silent. Uh, with that in mind, why don't we go ahead and give our panel a big round of applause and get some of that energy out. Okay, we're going to start with opening remarks. These will be five-minute opening remarks, and we will start with the yes side of the debate for opening remarks. Good evening. Good evening, St. Paulites. I am so blessed to be before you today as a proud Eastsider, as a minister, and as a member of an organization that is all about racial equity and economic justice for the state and for the city of St. Paul. And with that, I am so excited to talk to you about why we should all be voting yes for this ordinance that is about collective trash. It's about coordinating our trash collection. And that's what the ordinance is about. That is the thing we're voting on. And I can't express that explicitly enough. We're not voting on the contract, which I completely understand why some folks have an issue with it. Quite frankly, I've had my own issues with it too. But the thing about voting yes, that means that we are collectively saying together, all Minnesotans of every race, every religious background, regardless of what zip code you live in, we're saying, you know what? We're committed to one another and we're ready to throw down for one another. That means that we can come together and fight to make that contract manifest for all of us in the most equitable way, in the fairest way, and in a way that makes it so that every single one of us, every single one of our families can thrive. Everyone in this room believes those things. I know we do, regardless of what side you believe you're on right now. Now, let me have a conversation with you about what it used to look like in St. Paul many years ago, before we were as racially diverse as we are now, because we do have a city that's 50% people of color. But long ago before that, we had coordinated trash collection run by city workers. It was where city workers were making a livable, fair wage. And we said, we're gonna all throw down together and make sure this happens to keep our cities clean, to, to ensure that it is environmentally friendly, that we reduce the wear and tear. And what happened was, as we got more economically diverse and more racially diverse, a few politicians decided it would be best for us to privatize our hauling system. And as it got privatized, what happens when we get more racially diverse and after years of ghettoizing and redlining that happened with the discrimination that takes place across the country and St. Paul was no exclusion, well, People of color ended up getting hurt. People of color and those who are poor, my poor white neighbors were also impacted. And so what happens is, is we end up paying more or we were flat out denied services. And so when people make individualized choices, when we decide to say that it's not the city, which is us, we are the city, we are the government, it's not just those seven council members and the mayor, when we say together we're gonna do this, we're gonna put in the effort, we're gonna collectively say we can make this happen, then we can have all the great and awesome things that we deserve. We can make sure that our kids have the schools they deserve. We can make sure that our climate and our air is clean. We can make sure that we have the affordable housing that we need. We can make sure that we have the protections for our labor. All those things can happen. All those things are possible when we say, you know what? St. Paulites are ready. St. Paulites are ready regardless of where we live, what we look like, what our background is. We're ready to actually do this for one another. An amendment is possible. As a matter of fact, very appropriately named, there is an amendment already done that happened in December, and it's called the First Amendment of the Contract. The First Amendment, which means it is possible for us to have a second and a third and an eighth and a twelfth. But you know what? The best way to make amendments to that contract is for us to vote yes, to say we're going to do it together. 
to say that we can actually care for one another, that I can care for my neighbor, that you can care for your neighbor, that the person you're sitting next to matters, and that what they're going through, the billing issues, the, the service issues, those things can be fixed. They're fixable. But we have to commit to one another. We have to commit to one another because we all really do do better together. And that, that is something that is proven, that is tested. We've done it over and over again. We literally created the strongest sick and safe time policy in the country, not just Minnesota. And we did that because we worked together. So I encourage you to do what we're all called to do. And as in my faith tradition, we call it loving thy neighbor. And when we do that, we'll make sure that we're also loving ourselves. Thank you. I hope that you all vote yes with me for St. Paul. Thank you. And we'll continue opening remarks with uh, a five minute uh, opening remark from the no side of the debate. Um, my name's Elizabeth Dickinson, and here's why I support voting no. First, I'd like to establish what I support about the current system. I supported and continue to support a coordinated trash system believing it will reduce pollution and wear and tear on the roads. I support it because I believe everyone who wants trash service should be able to access it, regardless of zip code. Voting yes or no will not change or challenge the existence of a coordinated trash system. The old system is gone. However, I want the benefits and costs of a coordinated trash system spread out fairly and equitably. Currently, that is not the case. Unlike our neighbors in Minneapolis, St. Louis Park, Maplewood, and Bloomington, we pay more in St. Paul, yet can't opt out or share bins. There are no true incentives for those who generate less waste or who would like to. And small landlords like myself are forced to pay for a bin for every unit, regardless of whether or not we need or will use the extra bins. How is that fair? How does that encourage affordable rental housing to stay affordable? The city says on its FAQ sheet that nothing will change if vote yes prevails. Nothing changing is unacceptable. If the city had ever acknowledged the specific inherent inequities in the current system, rather than vaguely saying improvements could be made, I might have some faith. But once the city council refused to put the question on the ballot a year ago for voters to decide, I lost faith. Given the city says nothing will change if vote yes prevails, at this point, I believe the only way we even have a hope of initiating any change is to vote no. Council members Jane Prince and Kasum Basuri have written an op-ed suggesting that if vote no prevails and the ordinance is overturned and the contract remains, that haulers will not accept a payment plan that is based on twice yearly tax payments. That will open up the contract and make it easier to negotiate other aspects towards a fairer system. Even in the worst case scenario of shifting the cost to property taxes, the increase in property taxes will be less than we're currently paying for trash in 12 out of 17 of the city districts. The only distri districts where it increases are in five of the most affluent. Isn't that more progressive than the current system? And I'm gonna end here just in case, all right? All right, well, even if vote yes folks dismiss every argument for ways to renegotiate, then my question to them is specifically, what will you do to ensure, and yes, change the system so that it is more inequitable? I love the wonderful statements that Janae just said about working together, but I need to know what they acknowledge is unfair under the current system and the ways in which they'd improvement and hear a commitment about how they will work specifically to improve it. Thank you. So I'm gonna use the rest of the time. We're, we're, we're tag team, teaming this. Um, so uh, unfortunately, contrary to what you've heard, this is about the contract. Um, repealing the ordinance is the only way the city will have re leverage to renegotiate the contract. Vote yes means nothing will change. That's the reality. We could have a long discussion uh, among <laughs> lawyers about what this clause means and this phrase means, but what the Supreme Court said was that the referendum should go on the ballot and that the 
The, if the outcome is no, it would not impair the contract. All that means is the contract's legal, but it doesn't mean the contract can't be changed. And the spin coming out of the mayor's office saying, hey, there's nothing we can do. We gotta keep this contract in place and we gotta pay for it, and so we're gonna put it on your taxes. Those kind of threats, I think, is why we're at a point where we have an issue about trash that's become emblematic of many other things that are going on in the city. Uh, Janae cited some things that are very positive, or unsafe and sick time, et cetera, but we don't have a plan for how we're gonna fix the streets. We don't have a plan for municipal broadband, which is all about equity so that people can have access. We don't have a plan for what we're gonna do to bring jobs here. This is kind of at the fulcrum of, we got wrapped up in trash because the city decided to stop citizens who put together um, the necessary signatures allowed in the charter to put a measure on the ballot and they were denied. That's why it's dragged out for a year and it's become what it is. And as, uh, as Elizabeth said, Organized trash isn't going away. We don't believe that, we don't want it. And if you vote no, it doesn't mean trash trucks are coming back in your alley. But voting no does mean we can fix the contract and why wouldn't we all want that? Thank you. All right, thanks. We are gonna start with our first question and uh, this will begin with the no side of the debate. The first question is, in your opinion, what does an ideal trash system look like for St. Paul? We'll start with the no side of the debate. In an ideal system, I think we would have three things. We would have sharing, we would allow sharing, we would allow opting out of the system, and we would, uh, we would take away the provision that makes small landlords like myself, who have four or less units, have um, a trash bin for every unit, whether or not we need it. For the last 10 years, I've owned a triplex. I've only ever needed in that 10 years one large bin. And now I'm being forced to pay for three bins um, that I don't need and I don't actually have because I still only have the one bin. And that seems to me incredibly unfair. And for someone like myself who provides affordable housing, um, I just wonder where they think that the extra costs are going to go. Um, most of the people I know with affordable, who are providing affordable housing, who live in my neighborhood, are charging two to three hundred dollars less per month um, than the average rate, and some of the and that really eats in our ability to continue to provide affordable housing. So those are those are the three things I'd like to see fixed. So, simple question for you. I'm, I, I, I snuck in a lit piece just so I could use it for reference. So I hope it won't be seized by the, the uh, League of Women Voters. If you look at our lit piece out there, ask yourself why in Minneapolis, for $20 less per year, you get uh, curbside pickup of, uh, of lawn clippings, you get per curbside pickup of organics, you get trash pickup service every week, and up to 52 bulky items per year. Whereas in St. Paul, you pay $20 more um, and you get none of those things and you get two bulky pickup items that you have to call and schedule. It's a bad contract. I don't know, you know, it, it, it's that simple. This is about fixing a bad contract. It's not about ideology. It's not about choice, although I'm sure some people, you know, are very upset that they lost the choice to stay with a hauler that they want. The private market is gone. It's dominated by two players now, so if you like Comcast and CenturyLink for your internet access, you'll love waste management and Republic services for trash because that's what we're stuck with. But the reality is this is a bad contract that was not negotiated with the public in mind. We've got a, a binder here of all the people that complained and talked about what the problems were well before the contract was signed, and the city went ahead anyway with expediency that I believe was tied to our previous mayor's uh, gubernatorial ambition so he could show what an environmentalist he was, but we have a bad deal and it doesn't matter how we got here, let's fix it. And voting no is the only way to fix it because it will give the city the leverage to renegotiate and to bring the haulers back to the table, both in terms of the triggering event within the contract of a force majeure clause and the fact that haulers are not gonna be okay waiting until March to get, March and September to get paid for invoices. So that's the leverage we have, we should use it. Same question to the yes side of the, de the debate. You get three minutes on this. In your opinion, what does an ideal trash system look like for St. Paul? To me, an ideal trash system that works for St. Paul is one that um, is coordinated, is organized, um, that includes organics recycling. That is something that the city of Minneapolis has that we do not have and that we know that 
we need an organized collection system to move to that. Um, we are far from there because we are clawing our way back from a completely privatized system. Uh, it is good to hear the no side, at least the no side that's here tonight, say that they believe in organized trash collection because the rationale for the no vote has changed over time because it started very explicitly about protecting the old system, um, uh, the old privatized system. Uh, to me, what a, an improved system is, is starting from where we are and moving forward, not going backwards. And we were starting from a system that had 9,000 residents who either opted out or their landlord simply did not provide trash collection for them, but 9,000 residents, um, residences in the city of St. Paul that did not have trash service at all, and the city had no way of enforcing uh, that. W that created uh, a problem of illegal dumping. About $300,000 a year of our general budget went to uh, to deal with that, with that problem. Um, so a, 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 an, a, an ideal system is one where we all uh, participate equally um, and have equal access to service. Under the old system, you could call, move into the city of St. Paul, call uh, for service and be told, and people were, we're not accepting new customers because it was a pr completely privatized system. Then what were you to do? If your neighbors were good enough to, uh, to, to, to share their, their bin with you, you could do that. Or otherwise, you just had to figure out a way to get your own trash uh, away. So we are clawing our way back from a chaotic privatized system to try to do something that we urgently needed to do because the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency d stated in a study in 2008 that we would uh, reduce carbon emissions by 75%, the city of St. Paul, by simply doing this. This is the single most important thing the city of St. Paul has done to fight uh, global climate change is, has been organized trash, trash collection. And again, want to stress very importantly, what we are voting on next Tuesday is not the contract. The other side would like us to talk about the contract. They won't say a word about what's wrong with the ordinance, which is what we're actually voting on. That's what we're voting on. And not some theory that it might provide leverage, not some, not, we are simply voting. Do you support organized trash collection? And if so, vote yes on the ordinance that created it. We have a chance for rebuttals. We'll start with uh, the no side of things. You have one minute for a rebuttal. So it really, it, the fact that some people on the no side may have made it about choice doesn't have anything to do with what the group as a whole is about. And if Javier wants to make an issue of that, he can. The fact that there are 9,000 or is actually 9,800 residences in St. Paul that didn't have trash service, it turns out that several of those were actually apartments and other things that had were sharing dumpsters and didn't have carts. Uh, the data that the city uh, collected was not done scientifically, and the solution to the problem that he cites um, is, is easily achieved by addressing those people that didn't have service. Like now, they may not be able to afford it, and that's why they didn't have service. Um, and we could create subsidies to help people, which this program does not do. Um, it has done nothing to, sol to stop illegal dumping. And let's see the city produce any data that says so. In fact, there's probably as much or more illegal dumping because two bulky items a year is not enough. This is about the contract. You can call it about the ordinance. You can parse it however you want. Fixing it only happens if we vote no. And the yes side, do you have one minute for a rebuttal? Because under the old system, we had no, uh, no right to any bulky items being removed uh, in a year because you, it depended on what your hauler, what service your hauler provided. Um, again, we are clawing our way back from a system that was fundamentally unfair, inequitable around uh, around the city, where st some of the richer areas of the city paid lower rates than, uh, than than others because that's what the private haulers could do. All right, we'll move on to our second question, and we will begin with the yes side of the debate, uh, and you have three minutes. Uh, did the city engage citizens adequately prior to the rollout of the organized trash system? Prior to creating the organized trash system, again, the ordinance itself, the city held several public testimony forums. They also collected bills, put out a call to collect bills to see and notice very quickly the vastly different 
uh, billing that people were experiencing. They talked to residents who were saying, I can't get service here, or, you know, it was, it was a very inequitable and unequal system that hurt a lot of residents. And then on top of that, with all of the issues around the environment, there were people concerned about children because of so many trucks going down their alleys. And so, yes, the city council did did their due diligence to ensure that they spoke to the residents across zip codes to, before they created this ordinance. Again, I understand that there are folks who have an issue with the contract, and there were a number of things that happened with the, with the contract where they were trying to keep haulers. They were trying to keep the small family-owned haulers. And so a lot of uh, negotiating that happens in the you know, quote-unquote free market, um, when that happens and we're trying to make it as, as equitable as possible, it does raise the rates. And so I understand that there are you know, a lot of issues about billing and services, but again, the only real way to address those is to leverage our power, our collective power as the city. And we do that by saying collectively that yes, we're gonna do it. All right, we'll go to the uh, no side of the debate. Did the city engage citizens adequately prior to the rollout of the organized trash system? I don't believe so. Um, the main place that they did outreach was in Mac Groveland, and Mac Groveland is definitely not necessarily representative of the entire city. Um, I believe Tom has the entire report here, and I think he can provide some more details. So, um, with all due respect, the simple answer is no. The city did not come close to engaging the public in a meaningful way. In fact, the report that the Mac Groveland Council released in the note says, the survey is not demographically representative. Majority of responses came from Mac Grove, though respondents were recorded from every zip code within the city of St. Paul. 2,000 people totally were engaged, and the survey didn't, didn't uh, account for whether some people in the same household were responding or if people were even in the particular district where they said they lived. In addition, there were many things about additional negotiation considerations that were recommended to the city about what should be included in the contract that talked about the very things we're talking about today, opting out, sharing carts, uh, yard waste and bulky item pickup. Javier may be satisfied with two bulky items a year as opposed to zero, 52 items in Minneapolis, and they had, again, how did Minneapolis get the deal they did and St. Paul give away the farm. And the reason is St. Paul was negotiating on behalf of the haulers and the businesses and not on behalf of the residents. And ask yourself why commercial enterprises, large apartments, and condo associations are exempted from opt-in. If, if this is about climate change, affecting, responding to climate change, and dealing with global warming, that's some pretty big properties that are not part of the system that are able to negotiate their own rates and able to do so in such a way that it, it's contrary to state statute which says there must be incentives to reduce waste. It actually gives you an incentive to get, you get, you pay less the more trash you generate. That's, you know, the, it sort of uh, discounts for the more you produce. So the, pro the reason why we're here today is this process was rushed a certain constituency had the ear of our previous mayor, and this was pushed through, and reasonable people were not listened to. And I'm sorry, we can all come together and, and be of one mind, but as a lawyer, contracts rule, and if the contract says we don't have to come back to the table because we love the additional $12 million a year this provides to haulers, we're not coming back to the table. The only way the city's gonna get them to engage, in spite of all the goodwill we may have amongst each other, is to have an avenue to force the, the haulers back to the table, and that comes with a no vote, which repeals the ordinance, and then we have to figure out the payment system, which is something to negotiate over, and haulers are not gonna wanna wait until next March to get paid for trash hauling now, or September for trash hauling they do in March. And that's the leverage, that's the hammer we have, and why the mayor doesn't wanna use it, you'll have to ask him. And you have one minute for rebuttal uh, to the yes side. 
So I, uh, as a union leader, negotiated contract for 14 years. Um, a, the simple answer to what does, why does Minneapolis have things that we do not have here is that they've been negotiating contracts for years and years and years. A, a very simple principle in labor organizing is a first contract is not everything that we want. Um, and we improve contracts as we go along. What we don't do is bust the union and start, start from zero. That's why we don't have the things that, uh, that other cities that have been had an organized trash collect and collection system for decades, uh, d uh, that's why we don't have what, what they have. Uh, in terms of city engagement, we can always do better as a city and a community to, uh, to hear more voices. I think just the fact that just on any question that pretty usual suspects often do get heard in the city while others do not, may account for the fact that like a top priority for people was protecting haulers. Like, I, I, I don't think that most of our, our, our neighbors, uh, my neighbors on the west side cared one way or the other on that question, but those were the voices who came forward then. Okay, one minute rebuttal to the no side. No, that was the rebuttal. That was the rebuttal. That was their rebuttal. Uh, yes, but you have a chance. Yeah, we have you, you have yeah, one minute, too. Yep. You're rebutting um, the rebuttal. I also worked for union as a union rep and uh, negotiated contracts. And this idea that the first contract can't be everything you want. In this case, the haulers got everything they wanted, and we got nothing. So we got out, we got played at the negotiating table because we did not have the right people there. And why we didn't remains a mystery. Uh, they had, the national haulers had, you know, people that have negotiated contract for decades, and we had city staff with no experience. So that's why it turned out the way it did. And again, let's fix it. What's the problem with fixing it? Goodwill isn't going to fix it. Getting back to the bargaining table is what's going to fix it. If we wait four years to try to fix this for the next contract, following Javier's logic, we may have only one haul to, to deal with, and they may say, sorry, St. Paul, we don't care. We don't need your business. And then what? Think how expensive it will be then. All right. Uh, the next question, and you'll have three minutes to respond. We're going to start with the no side on this, is uh, tell us about uh, the force majeure clause and how it might uh, affect the contract between the city and the trash haulers if uh, the no vote is passed. The force majeure clause um, is a way, it's, it's considered an act of God. And what I was told today by the lawyer um, representing the no side is that there can be boilerplate language, but there's actually something very interesting that was added to the force majeure clause. And um, it says basically if an act of God, if you know, lightning, flood, fire, earthquake, whatever happens, that neither side is responsible for carrying out the contract. However, there's an additional piece to it, which, which includes legislative action. So if legislative action happens, that that could be some leverage for the city to force the haulers to come back to the bargaining table. At least that is how I understand it. Now the district court um, back in August um, basically um, supported all of this. The most, recent, um, the most recent decision, they stayed out of it. So there's been some misinformation coming from the city and the mayor, um, and I will let Tom uh, so finish off. I knew there was a reason why I went to law school. Um, <laughs> so the force majeure clause didn't have to include some of the things it did, but it included things such as saying that a legislative act, an act, a judicial act, could serve as a triggering event for it would, could be considered the equivalent of an act of God. Um, the district court cited the fact that a referendum was the equivalent of a ju judicial act, which the Minnesota Supreme Court previously ruled is the kind of triggering event that would trigger force majeure language. So we don't know what ultimately that means because what would happen is you vote no, uh, the, the vote no, if the vote no prevails and we have a triggering act, then it's up to the city to say to the haulers, okay, uh, we need to re renegotiate this contract or we may decide to get out of it. Um, we don't know what the city's gonna do except that the mayor has said he has no intention of doing that. And so force majeure gives the city the leverage, but the repeal of the ordinance gives the city the bigger leverage, which is the haulers have a contract. The, the way it's set up with the city is that if, if this goes on the property tax, they can only get paid twice a year. 
And I should add that if it goes on the property tax, literature that we have out there um, will show that, and as Elizabeth alluded to, in 12 of the 17 planning districts in St. Paul, if your taxes go up and your garbage bill goes away, you actually save money. Um, so these, the threats the mayor's making actually, um, it, it's, it's for most people, you're gonna be okay, but the city, the force majeure clause will give the city the opportunity to renegotiate if they choose to take advantage of it. And if the mayor chooses not to, then I suspect we're gonna see another lawsuit compelling him to renegotiate with the haulers as representative of the will of the people if the vote no prevails. That's why people need to vote no. All right, to the yes side, let's talk about the force majeure clause, how your side sees it uh, playing a role in here and what uh, effect it could have on the contract between the city and the trash haulers if a no vote is passed, three minutes. So important to say that yes, the district court did say that and then it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided uh, found that the city followed the process that it needed to follow uh, to, to implement, to create the ordinance, um, and found that the city does have a responsibility to provide for the health and safety of the community and provide uh, uh, trash service. Um, and, and it then further found, in plain English, that the, a success of a no vote would not, uh, would not impede or break the contract. It defies logic to suggest that the same court that did not see in a hypothetical no victory an impediment to the contract would then turn around and, and call it an act of God. It, the no side has been, since the Supreme Court uh, stated in plain language, again, um, they've been saying force majeure, force majeure, force majeure, like this is some sort of Harry Potter incantation. Uh, that will magically pry open the contract. That is not how contracts work. Um, the, the, to me, it, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an insult to voters to sort of suggest that this would so, simply be a, a, um, a rosy picture, that all they have to do is, is, um, is, is invoke the force majeure clause. Well, what does that mean? That means the city would be saying, the contract's invalid. So what happens to your garbage the next day? And when the city says to haulers, our contract's not, your, the contract's not valid anymore. Uh, breaking up a contract is a very big deal. That's why you have clauses in, contra in contract that like act of God, something beyond, um, some, it's, because it is an extreme thing uh, to, to do. So like that rosy picture is magical thinking. What we are voting on next week is a very simple ordinance that, that created organized trash collection. We should question the, like the fa the, this assumption that moving it to property taxes somehow only creates leverage for, the, uh, for those who want to change the contract but not for the haulers. Right now, they're billing individual residents under property taxes, which, by the way, are regressive um, and do not take into account your ability to pay. Under property taxes, they'll be building this, billing the city. It's actually, it is a, a uh, they're not billing you ind individually um, and uh, a more secure way of, uh, of, of getting paid. When you open a contract and everything becomes uh, uh, open. You don't just open a contract for one, uh, for one thing. Uh, that's why uh, I've, n I never in my 14 years um, uh, in, in the union uh, took that uh, took that position to reopen the contract because we make gains in contracts. And we'll go back to the no side for a rebuttal. I'm sorry, but Javier is misinformed about the law. Uh, I've op I've negotiated contracts and opened up just specific things. The same thing is here. You're not required to open up the entire contract. You can just negotiate over the provisions of uh, that are of most concern. But let's be clear what the Supreme Court said. The ballot that the city is wrong, that, the, that this is entitled to go on the referendum, and the city's argument that you can't let this go on the referendum because if it wins, it will impair the contract, the court said no, it will not serve as an impairment. And it's an impairment of performance, and not to get too technical, impairment of performance is not against the Constitution. Impairment of obligation would be against the Constitution. The city was saying it would be unconstitutional if you put this on the ballot. The court said, said no, it's not unconstitutional. The fact that it's a valid contract doesn't mean that it can't be 
it's not voidable by the city. The city can take actions to get out of it and use that as a point to negotiate better terms. Your trash will still get picked up the next day because the contract just doesn't end. That's what this, it doesn't end on the day of the vote. It ends if the city decides to try to end it, and that's up to them when they would bring that forward. You've got one minute on the yes side to respond. All right, folks. I am a woman of faith, so I wouldn't consider myself a betting woman, which means I would not bet on the fact that, as Tom has mentioned several times, contracts are binding, and a Supreme Court has said that that a no vote will not void that contract, which means they've already been wrong on the no side multiple times. So to bet that, oh, a force majeure would actually work, it just does not seem like a likelihood. An amendment would be a far better bet, and it would mean that we're not regressing back. We'd actually continue our collective trash ordinance, which is the thing, again, that we're voting on, not the contract. All right, on to another question. Uh, one of the criticisms of the contract is that it forces people to buy more capacity than they sometimes need. If your side wins, how would you address these concerns and what is the prospect for change uh, after November 5th? And we will begin with a response, a three minute response from the yes side. I am so glad that we've asked this question. So as a person who is what's considered a low waster, um, I produce very little waste, very little trash. And when this program initially started uh, in my new home, I had the giant 90 gallon uh, container. And so I was like, well, that's not really fair that I pay more and I produce way less waste. So I said, let me call my hauler and see if I can get a smaller container and less frequency because another pastor that I work with who is over in Highland Park was able to have that service. So I called Advanced Disposal, who is my hauler, and I said, hey, I want to have a smaller container and you know less frequency. And they said, oh, we don't do that in your area which reminded me of the issue that we were actually trying to defeat by coming together and saying we're going to do trash collection together. And so I knew that something was not right about that. So I contacted the city directly. And you know what? We got it fixed. And the only reason that that was possible was because that hauler could not any longer tell folks who live in my area that they weren't going to do something because it gave them an extra buck, that it made a better profit for them. And so the, the, th the reality is, is that as a low waster and those who are zero wasters, we should still contribute to the collective environment. We're all breathing the same air. We're drinking the same water. We should all contribute, but we contribute our fair share, which is smaller than those who need that, you know, 90, 95 gallon uh, bin. And so that, that's, that is just a very clear example of how this actually does work. When we all contribute, we all benefit. And I believe that it's a very small number of people in the city who currently take advantage of the smaller bin option. And, and in the case of Janae, there was misinformation given to her, just to be clear, like that that was a contract enforcement issue because the contract did not keep her from having a smaller bin. And the contract for a while didn't, didn't keep the hauler from giving her incorrect information, but then it was corrected. That's what we mean about moving forward and fixing problems, not looking backward. Because that is an option to avail that is available to a lot more people and that I believe it's only 7% of residents are currently taken advantage of. Yeah. Let's go to the no side with that same question. One of the criticisms of the contract is it forces some people to buy more capacity than they might need. If your side wins, how would you address those concerns and what is the prospect for uh, a change after November 5th to that. Thank you. I am all for everyone paying their fair share. I'm just not for some people paying more than their fair share. And frankly, that's what happens if you come after small landlords, such as myself, with a triplex, and say you must have three bins, whether or not you need them, thus raising the price three times and making me in a position of, well, how do I make up for this? I'm paying for a service I don't want, I'm not receiving, and somehow that is fair. 
I am all for everyone who wants trash collection to have it, regardless of zip code. I am absolutely for that. But what I am not for is passing on the inequities to other people. And so far, the other side, God bless them, but they haven't said how they're going to address that. And the only way we can get in to address that that I see is by voting out the ordinance and opening up the contract. They can keep saying it's about the ordinance, it's not about the contract, but the only way we have in to making inroads and to having any kind of leverage with the haulers is by repealing the ordinance so we can get to the contract. And that's where the inequities lie. Let's be clear how organized trash began and accepting that that is the, the, the law of the land right now. It was people that wanted to get rid of truck traffic in Mac Groveland alleys. I have no problem with that. Uh, there's a famous Margaret Mead quote that talks about the work of, of uh, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Uh, so God bless them for doing that. But you know what? This small group vote no is the same sort of people that wanted to fix a problem and they had no alternative to fix it because the city wouldn't listen to them. What I hear from Janae and Javier is the same sort of stuff we hear from the city. Oh, well, you could do this and you could, you know, you could nibble around the edges here. This is a terrible contract and this idea that we're, we have it wrong, went to district court and won, and won, went to the Supreme Court and won. I think the lawyers for this side know what they're talking about and know that this is about the contract and not just about the ordinance. And the answers are very clear because the answers were in this study by Matt Groveland where they talked about additional considerations. And it was about sharing cards. It was about opting out. It was about curbside pickup. We know the solution is what Minneapolis is doing. I talked to a landlord who has a fourplex, paid $300 a year previously. Now he's paying $1,300 a year, an additional $1,000 like he's just supposed to take out of his pocket. Well, who do you think's paying? The renters. Someone who had no trash service at all, they're now paying additional $264 a year with the cheapest car, whether they are poor or rich. How is that equitable? There are numerous cases where this isn't equitable, and this is just a lot of nonsense about we're going to feel good and we're going to call and reduce our card, and that's going to solve this problem. It's not going to work that way. And to the yes side, you've got one minute for a rebuttal. Multiracial democracy is hard. And anyone who says anything different has not actually tried it. And so when we're talking about, I want to really address the issue that, that my sister Elizabeth brought up, this notion of we haven't actually said how we're going to do it. I actually have. We organize. We come together and we force, we the people, we the citizens, we the government, we are the ones who actually declare what, what is going to happen with our trash system. We are not merely consumers. We are not merely customers. We are the government. So we are the ones who can actually say, these are the amendments that have to take place. If these haulers want to have a contract with us moving forward past our four-year mark, then they're willing to work with us. Response. One minute for a response. So we, the people, spoke up with thousands of complaints of what was wrong with this system, the very things we're talking about today. We the people organized in 2017 before this contract was signed and talked about all the problems this was going to create, the very things we're talking about, car sharing, raising costs, that we need an equitable system that's fair to everybody. And what did our leaders do? They said, screw we the people. They didn't care what we the people thinks. Now, maybe it wasn't, in fairness, maybe it wasn't a multiracial, uh, multicultural enough, because this did start in Mac Groveland, which is mostly a white community. So maybe that's what was missing, is we didn't have enough people in enough cultures that were the ones saying this is a bad system. But I don't see how us coming together and not being listened to is going to change if we don't have any leverage. And I don't see how someone poor, regardless of their color or background, having to pay $264 that they don't have and having to choose between whether they're going to have their medications or pay their trash bill is equitable. Uh, equity doesn't know color when it comes to something like that. All right, we're moving on to another question. And this is uh, about the Minnesota Supreme Court recently ruling uh, that the city is obligated to uphold the current contract even if a majority of citizens vote no uh, next week on November 5th. So given this, what does a no or a yes vote mean going forward? 
We're going to start with the no sides of, uh, side of the debate. So that's not what the Supreme Court said. The Supreme Court said, only ruled on two things, and I'm sorry to be a broken record. The referendum goes on the ballot, and the contract is valid. That doesn't mean the contract can't be changed. It was basically saying the contract will not be impaired, meaning the performance of the contract by both the haulers and the city will not be impaired. You'll still be able to keep your contract if you want to. So the fact that, the, unfortunately, the media used the mayor's talking points instead of talking to the lawyer that actually argued and won the case is really unfortunate. That happened today. We had a press conference. The media came, and they asked questions. And he made it clear, force majeure, all those things were not addressed by the court. I know it sounds complicated, what's a valid contract versus avoidable contract, but it means that if there's a triggering event, the city now has the power to go to the haulers and say, we want to change the contract because this has happened, and this is, in, this is in the language of the contract that says, if these events occur, we have the right to request to renegotiate. At the very least, if the ordinance is repealed, it means there's no way to pay for the contract. So the city's going to have to renegotiate that aspect with the haulers, which gives them leverage. Voting no, the vote no position is, you have to vote no to give the city a chance to be able to use what this one, one of the few things within this one-sided contract that actually will benefit the residents. Vote yes means you will do nothing because the haulers will say, look, we're making $12 million additionally each year under the contract we signed. We don't have to come back to the table and give any of that money back unless you say, well, you don't get paid till March and you don't get paid till September and we have to figure out a payment plan then you have the leverage to get them back to the table. But without that, so vote no is the only way to change the contract. Vote yes uh, preserves the status quo. And if you like the version of the status quo that Javier and Janae have put out for you and how that's going to be a powerful way to fix it, then you should vote yes. I think it's very clear that the vote no is the only way that we have any power. Do we have any time left? Mm -hmm. Yes, ahead, you do. If you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, if... If vote yes prevails, I mean, I know Janae has said she feels like she's been specific. If vote yes prevails, I would like the first call that Janae makes on uh, uh, the day after to be me and to, and to say, for her to say to me, so how are, so Elizabeth, how are we going to um, change these things that, that I acknowledge are inequitable in the system? Because Honestly, I've lost faith with the city. I lost faith with the city the moment they didn't put this on the ballot. It's very, very hard with the things coming out of City Hall to believe that there is a serious acknowledgement of the inequities in the current system and a plan to address them. I'm not hearing it. I'm really not. Thank you. And it's uh, time to go to the yes side with this question. The Minnesota Supreme Court recently ruled that the city is obligated to uphold the current contract if a majority of citizens vote no on November 5th. Given this, what does a vote no or a vote yes mean going forward? And you have three minutes. So a vote yes means that we continue our coordinated collective trash, which is important name that it is working for many, many people. There are many people who have a lower bill. There are many people who are happy with the service that they're getting. And there are many people who are ready to move forward. There are also folks who are having issues. And that is why we're gonna come together as a city, and that is all of us, right? Because every single person who show up at City Hall is there on behalf of not just themselves, but their neighbor. And we'll make sure that we can get the proper amendments so that the contract works equitably for all of us. So, Go ahead. Um, it's important, I think, to just think about your, your question is what does a yes, no mean, and what does no mean? What we've heard from the no side is a theory for changing the contract. It's a theory that maybe the force majeure will work and open the contract and then uh, and we nego negotiate. It's a theory, but let's play this out. What we're actually voting on is the ordinance. That gets removed. What will we be spending the next few months doing? Well, writing a new ordinance, 
uh, who might have a voice in that process? We all should, right? Well, how about the folks who, uh, say, businesses, small and big, who under a system, uh, under uh, having to pay through property taxes, will be paying twice for garbage because they'll pay through property taxes, but they still have to do their own, which they do uh, now their own, own garbage hauling. They may, in the process, want to, you know, right? They, they will insert themselves in, in that process and have a, a, have a voice. And we'll be writing and rewriting this for months, uh, to, uh, perhaps uh, years uh, to, to come. That's under the best case scenario. Or we could declare the contract voided, create all kinds of uncertainty uh, and perhaps chaos in, in garbage collection, all to follow a theory that maybe this will work. Um, now, how we move forward, like, I am not, like uh, Elizabeth, a landlord. I am a tenant. I've been a tenant for 18 years. I've always had my own, we've always had our own um, uh, 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 um, garbage bin, um, and we've seen no change in our landlord. I, I think just accepting the fact that he owns the equity on the home, not us, uh, he's, absorbed, uh, he's absorbed costs. Um, whatever they are. We've not had that discussion with him, but um, the, 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 the fact that like some landowners, uh, landlords are either not taking advantage of smaller bins, or as Elizabeth herself has told us, she's not even following the current. She only has one bin right now, um, shows you the power that a landlord has to make decisions over their tenants, um, and that is not what we are debating right now, um, is, uh, of, is landlord rights. Uh, let's go to the no side for a rebuttal. One minute. You know, one of the things that actually, I'm just going to go broad here for a moment because I think everyone can understand the inequity of having to pay for a service that you don't actually need. What grieves me about all of this is that I will sit here and say, you know what, we had an inequitable system before and this was an attempt to make it more equitable, but it's really failing some people. And whenever we bring up the ways in which it is failing people, it's not actually ever acknowledged by the other side the specifics that I'm saying of where it is failing people. And that really grieves me, because one of the things about active listening, and that's, that's listening when you really listen to the other side, is that you actually acknowledge the things that are causing pain on the other side. And I don't hear that, I just hear rebuttals. I will acknowledge that there were inequities in the system and that I wanted to see those addressed, but they, can, they, they caused other inequities and those also need to be addressed. And that's, and, and it just grieves me that there's no acknowledgement on that side. To the yes side, do you have a response for one minute? I'm grieved that you lost faith in our government. I'm grieved that you believe that there's no such thing as a collective we. And I am grieved that, quite honestly, we're really not acknowledging the fact that this actually is really engulfed in racial inequity. Like, the, the oh, I'm, I'm sorry, folks. It is what it is. When we live in a city where black people per capita make 14000 a year and white people make 43000 when we're talking about who are low income, who are we actually talking about? When white people own property at 68% and black people own it at 24%, who are we talking about? So the, the, issues, the issues are real. And the issues can be fixed and addressed. But it is literally when black and white people, when Hmong people, when Muslims and Christians, when folks in Highland Park and Phelan Park all come together and say, we're going to do this together. It is hard. We can do it. We can do it. We have to break past the cynicism. We are the collective we. We can do it. I went on hey. last September. OK, we're, uh, we aren't. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Okay, we're ready to move on to closing statements. And let, let's let them make their points, and you can discuss it afterwards. So, closing statements, we will start with the uh, no side of the debate, and you have five minutes. I'm trying to think of which way to go. 
Um, over 50% of the tenants that I've had over the last 10 years have been people of color. They have been people who, um, not just people, I mean, there's been just a, a rainbow of people. They work as nurses' aides, they work as teachers, they work as retail clerks, they work as bank clerks. Um, I know I provide um, housing, which is um, less than market rates, and, and I'm not a slum landlord by any means, and I think any of my tenants would probably say I was a really great landlord because I'm really, I am really responsive to them. And I just, I still don't understand why there isn't an acknowledgement of that piece of it, which I think is an underrepresented piece given that I think about 20% of housing is um, duplex, triplex, or fourplex. And I wish the city would do a real study to see how much of it is affordable and how much below market rate it actually is and how this is affecting them. But as I said at the beginning, this vote is about change. If you vote yes, then nothing will change. The city's own frequently asked questions actually says that nothing will change. So an unfair and inequitable system will continue. If you vote no, then there's at least a chance, there's a chance that the most unfair and inequitable parts of the contract will be re-examined. Of course, some of that depends on the political will of the city's elected officials. Perhaps they don't want it to change, but at least they'll be given a set of tools that can help them make the changes that some of us would like to see. So please vote no, and thank you for your consideration. Um, I, I, think, I think it's, uh, the vote no effort is a bipartisan effort. Um, there are people from all walks of life, political perspectives, ideologies. It's been that way from the start. I think it's really a shame that this has been turned into a partisan issue where the DFL chose to endorse a vote yes position and is spending a lot of money on this and trying to make this about partisan politics instead of what it really is, which is about equity. If we want to have a discussion about racial equity, let's have that discussion. But if we're going to talk about it in the context of trash, tell me how it's equitable that if previously you were sharing a bin with someone because you don't have the money, if you were sharing it with three or four people, and now you have to pay $264 a year and you are living on a fixed income, you are someone who is living near the poverty line, or you are someone who is, uh, owns a property, a duplex, triplex, and you're providing affordable housing, and now you have to, not just a 50 bucks, but $1,000 extra, tell me how that's equitable. I don't know anybody, any person of color or any per person of a different cultural background than mine that would consider that equitable. We can, we organize trash is here to stay and our responsibility as responsible residents is to make it a contract and a system that works fairly for everyone. Clearly it does not and for partisan reasons and to save face and for the mayor who could have said, look, I didn't create this mess, but I'll fix it, because it didn't happen on his watch, to turn this into, oh, this is a group that doesn't care about equity and this is about race, whatever, I think is really unfortunate. This is about solving a problem. And you know whether you're uh, someone with a legal background like me, or a union organizer like Javier, or a minister like Janae, or an activist like Elizabeth who's worked on energy issues and everything, we're, it's all about solving problems. And we can come together to do that. But what I see tonight is just reinforcing rhetorical positions saying, oh, this is so unfair and it's so much better. It's mediocre. Look at what Minneapolis has and what St. Paul has and ask why we didn't get it right the first time. We didn't get it right the first time because we didn't try. We had people at the table that weren't negotiating. They were sitting at the same side of the table as the haulers. And now we have two multinational companies that control our trash. When this contract is up for renewal, we may have one hauler left. And if we don't agree to the terms they dictate to us, they may well abandon the St. Paul market. Now, while we still have six haulers left from the 15, we have a chance to fix it. So if we vote no, we have a chance to fix it. If we vote yo, yes, you're going to be stuck with the status quo. And this city is not working well on these kind of issues. And the proof is in the pudding. 
All right, let's move on to the yes side. You have five minutes for closing remarks. We're voting next week, yes or no, on an ordinance, on the ordinance that established organized trash collection. On, on Almanac, um, Tom said that this is a referendum on the mayor, and he's, um, the, uh, many people have remarked on just the, the level of the, the rhetoric, how he has become, the, uh, he has called the mayor a dictator. Um, and indeed, we're up up here against you know with two of the the um, the, the mayor's uh, opponents in the last election. So, I too lament the way this has become partisan and so focused on a mayor. Which, by the way, he did not negotiate this contract. The prior mayor did. Um, but let's take a step back from uh, fr from the level the discussion has been up to now, uh, and just. Let's think about where we are in the world right now. On August 28, 2018, a young woman, 16-year-old named Greta Thunberg, stood in front of the um, the Swedish Parliament with a sign saying "Strike for uh, uh, School Strike for Climate Change." She sat alone, and she was one voice, one young person, demanding that her elders, that politicians, do something about the crisis of climate change. She might have seemed to passers-by like uh, uh, you know, a, a strange person, an oddity, a lonely dreamer. But just a year later, Greta Thunberg was joined by millions of others across the world in every continent making the same call. And Greta was, of course, not the first to remind the world and all of us of the planet um, that it, the dangers that lie before us. But the movement that she helped catalyze does remind us that while alone we, we may feel righteous or even comfortable, to make big, big, bold change, we must act together. A 2009 study by the Minnesota Pollution Control study, uh, Agency found that an organized uh, system of trash collection in the city of St. Paul would reduce carbon emissions in our city by as much as 75%. The same study showed that cities with organized trash collection have higher rates of recycling and spend less on road repair. This is why the city of St. Paul, which is to say we, the people of St. Paul, moved to take action over two different administrations to move from an old system that was entirely privatized, inequitable, and we did this as a first step in, our, in us as a city doing what we need to do to, be, to do right by, and to be on the right side of history, because there is so much more to do. Why do residents of Minneapolis have organics recycling re collected by their ha haulers? Because they have had organized trash collection longer. That's a recent thing that they've done, but they've built on what they had before. We in St. Paul, we also would like organics recycling. And that's why we must look forward, not backwards, and vote yes for St. Paul. If we spend the next months or years relitigating the ordinance we are voting on, how much longer before we catch up with organics recycling? It's anyone's guess. Have there been problems with implementing the new system? Absolutely. When moving from the chaos of the disorganized system, there have to absolutely been problems. Janae told you about, and, you know, speaking of listening to each other, to actually recognize a, we presented a problem by the, of the current system. Um, and it, this turned out to be not a problem even of the contract, but of the implementation, and it was frustrating. I spoke with Janae about this. She was frustrated. Um, she didn't say, well, this didn't work. Let's throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's, let's start all over. She said, let's, let's see if we can find a way. And in fact, there was a way to move forward. I moved with my husband to St. Paul 18 years ago. We have rented the same house on the west side of St. Paul the entire time we have lived here. I love our neighborhood and its rich diversity. On the west side, we speak many different languages and come from different cultural backgrounds, practice different faiths. But there are times, I admit, that the city of St. Paul can frustrate me. When I first moved to Minnesota and I'd hear people from Minneapolis and St. Paul talk about, say things like, I never go over there. I would always, I have a terrible sense of direction. So I would always think like, how do you know which one you're in? Because I, because I always get lost. And then someone would always say like the river, and, which is annoying. Um, but what I, what, it, 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 there's, what has most frustrated me is that sometimes in, in St. Paul, we seem to take pride in being for no, in saying no to things, almost say, taking pride in, in being the stepchild um, that is ignored. Uh, 
for too long. We have been unwilling to make the bold changes that we need to make as a city and act together. This is not just about what we, us, me personally paying for a service that I don't need. It's about us acting collectively. And we have bigger things to do for our planet than talk about this for years to come. OK, thank you, Javier and Janae and Tom and Elizabeth. We appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks to everyone who attended, and we hope you learned more about each side of the debate. Thanks to SPNN for broadcasting this and hosting us, and also to the League of Women Voters, St. Paul, for organizing tonight's, tonight's debate. And good night. <laughs>